Welcome to Life, Laughter, Divorce, episode 55. I am your host, Leanne Linsky. And I'm the boyfriend. And we are back once again for the wonderful week of divorce. Another one. Yes, always, always, always. And we hope you're having a wonderful week too. And while you're out there tuning in, make sure you rate, review, and subscribe, but not if you are in your car. Don't text and drive. Drive. <laughs> and then, hey, while you're out there, don't forget to check out the web at lifelaughterdivorce.com. Check out the blog for the show note updates, contact information, and thoughts from Mom Anonymous on each episode. Don't forget the social media, all that all stuff. All that too. stuff. Yeah. They know our yeah. listeners are on top of it, man. Good for them. Yeah. Right. Thanks, Thank you. you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think we say thank you enough. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for listening to her. <laughs> <laughs> and hey, you know, um, one of uh, the things that Mom Anonymous, speaking of Mom Anonymous and her thoughts on the blog, uh, Mom Anonymous, I know, is a fan of celebrity gossip, gossip if you will, <laughs> right? Like Dancing with the Stars, like all this stuff. Like she knows all kinds of this stuff and who dated who and who. Married who, broke up, all that good stuff. And like she's on People top of Magazine, it. Us Weekly is in her head. Right. Yeah. Yes. She's like a Rolodex of information. <laughs> right? It's impressive. It is. Right? Yeah. It's very impressive. So I think uh, Mom Anonymous is really going to enjoy this particular episode. Um, our guest today actually has a lot of knowledge about the ins and outs of celebrity dating and relationships. It was fascinating to go back and listen to her insights on on the aspects of dating someone who is a celebrity and all of the extra stuff like dating you and i dating we have our own ins and outs and our troubles and our things right but just to be a celebrity and to deal with it from a public standpoint is oh my just gosh amazing and and to listen to this interview and have her talk about all of those aspects is just fascinating you know what boyfriend you know what i haven't asked you like what what celebrity couple are you a fan of what <laughs> <laughs> Is there like a celebrity out there that you're always like, oh, they seem to have like a really great life? Sure. No? (laughs) No, I don't pay attention to them. No? Yeah. I'm I'm trying to take care of my own life and in my own relationship with you. Well, this is true. Yeah. This is true. Okay. You're you're, you're enough to worry about. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, there's that. Well, I don't know if you guys out there have your favorites. I'm guessing you probably do. Or, I mean, there's at least somebody in your favorite show that maybe you know about. Me? I don't know anybody our listeners oh they, yeah i'm sure I mean, they... we've already established that you have no <laughs> <laughs> no connection <laughs> no connection with this at all but there are those of us who you know like a favorite singer or something like that where it's like oh wow i you know can't believe they broke up or something like that well i did see recently talking about celebrity gossip what that jennifer aniston and brad pitt saw each other or something for the first time in like what years yeah sure really i guess huh yeah I haven't been following that one. That one's like, wow, that's resurfacing. I'll have to check out the the tabloids. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know what? It's just the, the boyfriend hides his the, head in shame. <laughs> yes, <laughs> please do. Um, well, you know what? It's the other thing. Maybe boyfriend, you don't necessarily follow celebrities, but do you follow along in like movies? Have you ever had like your movie image of what a relationship would be ever in your life? Oh yeah, and it's terrible. Like there, there was a story on the thing about rom coms and and how that they portray relationships and what men should be for women in rom coms versus what they are in real life. Like if any of those guys on any of these romantic comedies did this in actual real life, the women would be calling harassment and and all all these other Me Too things that are going on right now, oh, which are very kind of, important. Right. Yes. But but to get away with it on a movie and what women expect versus what really happens in real life, there's a disconnect. And that's causing problem. That is the potential for causing problems with men and dating in the current environment. Right. Because if you actually showed up outside the door holding signs in a boombox, <laughs> <laughs> they actually did talk about that. I know, right? <laughs> there are weird things like that. Yeah. It's weird because I think at some level we see so much of people in in the celebrity world that you know we feel so we have some sort of weird connection with them when we really don't. You know. A lot of people do. I don't personally necessarily. Well, you know, yeah. But you can get that way off social media and things like that. You know, you think you know people be based on what they post on social media, but really they're only posting what they want you to see. It's very filtered and very selective. Well, 
Not everybody is selective <laughs> of what they post, mind you. But a lot of us are selective onto what we put out there to the world. But anyway, I don't want to totally give away everything that we talk about with our guest this week. She was really, really fun to talk to and, and had a lot of really valuable information to bring to the table. So we hope that you guys enjoy her as much as we did. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about our guest. Aranda Richard-Smith is an award-winning psychotherapist and relationship expert. Her advice has been featured in U.S. Weekly Magazine, The Huffington Post, Bravo TV, Ebony Magazine, Teen Vogue, and Glamour Magazine, among others. In 2016, she was inducted into the inaugural Woman of Worth class for her leadership in the mental health and relationship space by Los Angeles-based company Worthy Woman. In 2017, Match.com CEO Mandy Ginsberg also named her as one of the top dating and relationship experts in the country. With over 15 years of experience, Rhonda is passionate about helping people improve their personal lives, relationships with others, and overall emotional health. Wow. Yeah. So without further ado, I'd like you to meet Ms. Rhonda Richard-Smith. Rhonda, welcome to Life After Divorce Podcast. Thank you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. We are so happy to have you here. I've been I've been looking forward to this because I know our blogger, Mom Anonymous. I think I had mentioned her to you when we met. She actually um, loves celebrity news and gossip. So when I met you, when we talked about your background, um, I was like, oh my goodness, she's going to be so happy to listen to this episode. <laughs> it's finally here. Yay. I know. Awesome. I know. I know. It was a while ago. So yeah. Yeah. I haven't seen you since the holidays. So here we are. And um, so just to give our listeners a little bit of, of more background about you is now uh, you are married, right? I am. And you have two two daughters? Yes, two daughters. daughters. Wow. And you're we were just talking that she is selling Girl Scout cookies, you guys. So I sure am. Place Anyone your that's orders. Interested. I'm gonna yes. put all of her contact information in the show notes. So reach out and get some of those thin mints and those shortbreads. And what are the new ones this year? Any new ones? Uh, well, the s'mores, they had them last year, but they have a s'more sandwich cookie that's pretty popular. Ooh, six dollars okay. instead of five this go around it's a little extra a little you pay extra, a little more for that a little extra marshmallow going on in there yeah 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 oh, nice. pretty popular <laughs> which are your favorite oh that's a good question um hmm, i like the samoas oh yeah i like the classics from when i was a kid i like i like the samoas i think they're my favorite i used to love thin mints but i think i burned out on thin mints as a kid yeah, um, I ate so many, so I burned out a little bit. But I love Samoas. Nice, yeah. There's oh, they're delicious, and I uh, I need to stay away from those. So I might have to get a box or so for friends. And I put friends in quotes. <laughs> friends may need those. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so well, awesome. Well, I know that is keeping you busy. So I appreciate you taking the time out to talk to us today. And of course. Um, Let's, I want to hear more about, about what you do um, in, your, in your therapy business. So, yeah. So I am a licensed psychotherapist and a relationship mm -hmm. expert. Um, so I do a lot of consulting with national media outlets uh, regarding like celebrity dating and relationships. Um, so I typically give tips and advice on um, what people should do in their relationships or if they're dating and they need some suggestions on how to get back out there. Um, and also for people that have been married for a while and they hit a rocky patch, um, I also work with couples on kind of devising plans to kind of enhance and improve their relationships as well. Ah, okay. And do you work with celebrities themselves? I have worked with some celebrities in the past. Um, and I've also um, worked a lot with Us Weekly on different um, celebrity-based articles. So I did some things on Kate Hudson when she was dating Nick Jonas. 
um, which was kind of an interesting time. Uh, when Gwen Stefani and Blake Shelton got together, I did a story with Us Weekly on was it a rebound romance? Would they make it or wouldn't they make it? Um, and then I've done a lot of things on like The Bachelor and The Bachelorette, which is always fun and interesting reality TV. Right, right. Well, I know Mom Nanimous is a fan of The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. Um, and I'm a huge Gwen Stefani and uh, Blake Shelton fan. So <laughs> I'm kind of curious. Did, what did you predict for, for Blake and Gwen? I actually thought they might make it um, because I thought that they were kind of in a similar situation. And it's always tricky when you meet someone on the job, when you're meeting someone at work. Um, I talked a little bit about how sometimes we tend to vent with people that we work with during the day. We spend so much time with them. Um, and so it can be a slippery slope because you want to be sure that you're um, explaining what your issues and concerns are to your, to your actual spouse versus just <laughs> venting to your coworkers and your yeah. spouse never hears anything about it because um, that can happen. But I think it was kind of a unique and interesting um, experience in terms of the way that they came together. Um, and their personalities seemed to mesh really well together. And I thought that even though it was kind of coming off the heels of her divorce, um, I thought the timing was really good and that it might actually work out. So I just gave some tips for if you're not sure if it's rebound love or not, just to be sure that you're over the relationship that you were in prior and that your current relationship isn't based off of venting or bashing your ex, mm. um, because that's not going to hold water in the long term. So, right. They made it so far so good. So I know it's, it's pretty awesome. And uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I like it when things turn out well. That's always a good, a good feeling to see other people and, and find some happiness. And, Absolutely. And so and with them, I think you made a couple of good points. Like there is a thing about when people are married, but yet if they don't work together, they vent to coworkers. I, I hear a lot of people talk about they have their office husband or their work wife or things yes. like that. And that can all, there's a fine line there, isn't it? There's absolutely a very, very fine line. Um, you know, if you're seeking out your coworkers for advice or tips or thoughts on what you should do, again, a lot of that energy and conversation should really be directed toward your partner. Um, and sometimes you're kind of all vented out and you've discussed everything you want to discuss with your coworkers. So by the time you come home, you've got nothing to say. Yeah. Because you feel like you've talked it out, but you talked it out with the wrong person. Mm, so that, that happened. Yes. And, and when people do that, I mean, I guess, I guess a lot of us have experienced something like that, um, you know, and I'm thinking back, but is it often that in that they end up getting in a relationship with that office husband or work wife or, um, and that becomes, they, it feels more intimate because they're having those conversations with those people. Absolutely. Because they're having really intimate conversations, conversations that they should, again, really be having with their partner. Yeah. Um, but as they continue to kind of grow and develop a bond, um, and, you know, the coworker may be um, very well intentioned in terms of trying to help them with their relationship. Um, but in doing so, it's such kind of a sacred um, bond that they start to develop um, that sometimes that can get to be stronger than your actual marriage or the relationship that you're in. Um, because you're having these deep conversations about your thoughts and your feelings and you're kind of pouring your heart out. Um, but then if your partner's just kind of getting a, a blank wall or a blank stare when they come home, um, it doesn't really give them an opportunity to work on the situation with you to resolve it, um, which isn't, that's just not good. That's, that's not going to go anywhere if you're doing that. So it's a slippery slope. There's nothing wrong with maybe checking in with a friend or two on if they have tips or ideas. But I think you also want to be really careful about who you're seeking advice from in general. Yeah. Um, because if it's someone who's not in a great relationship or it's someone who's always been really unlucky in love. I don't know if that's the person that I would go to for advice. That's a really good point. Um, you know, because a lot of us immediately go to a best friend or whoever we're closest to at the time. And if, and that the influence there can be skewed based on their own personal experience. So if, if that person isn't very healthy in a relationship, then likely they're not going to give you very healthy advice. Absolutely. And then also what you're presenting is very one sided. So you're presenting your side of the story, mm -hmm. um, which is your interpretation. It's coming through your eyes and your experience. 
Um, and so they're basing their advice on one side. Um, someone would have to know both sides or have some idea of what's going on in totality to really provide you with any real sound advice. Yeah. What would you recommend if, when people are, well, if they're married and they're having trouble, what kind of, of therapist would they seek out? Um, I think it really depends. Um, couples therapy can be really powerful. And a lot of people don't realize that, um, you know, you can seek couples therapy if you're trying to resolve an issue in your marriage or your relationship. But sometimes people seek couples therapy to figure out how to kind of split their lives up and how to move on. Um, and so depending on what you're seeking the therapy for or what you're trying to resolve, um, I think it's a really great option. Um, I also think that, you know, when you're going into a situation like that, if there are maybe more serious mental health issues or issues with like trauma in someone's history, and that's really what the brunt of the issue is in the relationship, that might require more like individual therapy or counseling to kind of work through some of those issues. We all have, you know, a family history and a family story. Um, you know, we all have different things that happen throughout childhood and we've all experienced trauma on some level, whether great or small. Um, and that can have a profound impact on the way that we approach relationships, uh, the way that we communicate and our ability to kind of be vulnerable and expose ourselves to our partners. A lot of times when you have folks that have experienced a lot of trauma, it's very, very difficult to kind of get to that deeper level um, because to do so really requires you to uncover some of your baggage and um, some of the trauma that you experienced uh, when you were younger. So that comes up as well. Right, right. Okay. And I know um, in talking to different different therapists in this past year on the on the podcast and things like that, but on, on different topics, um, you know, everybody has their own specialty on where they what they work with and, and kind of those kind of things. So, um, where's a, what's a good resource for people to use, um, depending on what their issues are? Is it just like Google searches or? I mean, you, you could, I mean, there are some, there are some great articles online from different therapists on different relationship topics. Um, I have a series that I just started called Love Insight, um, which is actually a relationship uh, coaching series. And so what I'm focusing on right now, um, which I think is really interesting for singles is, you know, you can kind of get in a cycle of dating and, and you know, things not working out and kind of being confused and, and frustrated and kind of tired of the process. Um, and I think what happens oftentimes is people are sometimes attracting the same people repeatedly um, and kind of going through a cycle of almost feeling like it's Groundhog's Day, like they're experiencing the same thing over and over again with the same outcome time and time again. Um, and so a lot of what I try to focus on with the individuals that I work with is really getting honest about what kind of partner that you're looking for. Um, I did a lot of work with Match over the summer. I attended their Dating Expert Summit in Dallas. And we talked a lot about this at the summit as well. People will say that they want, they have a particular type, let's say, I want a person that has ABC. And you say, okay, great. So, you know, you could set them up on with somebody who has ABC, they meet someone who has ABC, and yet they're not attracted, they're not interested, they want DEF. Mm. But they insist that they want ABC. Um, so what I think in terms of working with folks that either are kind of in pre-contemplation of like, not sure they want to get back out there with dating, or if they're just kind of getting started, really just getting clear about what it is that you're looking for and being okay with it. Um, I think there are so many messages out there and there's a lot of advice. Some would say there's too much advice, um, on what you should be looking for or who you should be looking for. And sometimes when you're taking in all that information, it's hard to sort out is this what I want? Is this what my mother says I need? Is this what my best friend says I need? Um, is this who my roommate says I should go out with? Or is it really what you want? We're all individual people. We all have different needs. We've all had different experiences. Um, and there are different people out there for us that would be great, but it's just really about being clear and honest about what it is that you're looking for and being okay with that and not mm -hmm. feeling, feeling like you have to explain yourself to someone or you have to justify it. Um, what you're looking for is what you're looking for. And ultimately that's, what's going to make you happy. 
Um, So a lot of the work that I do is kind of around quieting the noise, so to speak, and really kind of getting centered with yourself on who you are, making sure that you understand your worth as a person. So that way you're attracting the person that you really want, that really will kind of mesh well with you and will kind of be that final puzzle piece in your life. I think that's really important. Yeah, you actually, that really struck me what you just said about who you are to attract that person. Do you find that, um, I know like when we hear our friends talk and it's like, I want a guy or a girl with X, Y, Z, this, 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 this. And then you look at your friend who's saying it and you're like, but look at, you don't have those qualities. Exactly. Like you, who do you, you need to become to attract that kind of a person because sometimes right. we have a different perception of who we, we are and we don't realize what, what our own strengths and weaknesses are in order to get that person. Absolutely. And then we also put so much pressure on our partners to kind of fill a particular void or need that we may have that we really need to work on filling ourselves first. Yes. Um, you want to have two holes coming together, not two halves, you know, my other half, my other half, but you really want to have two holes that are coming together. And that's, what's really important. And, um, particularly for women and, but for men as well, um, unfortunately, you know, we have domestic violence issues and there are other things that can come up in relationships and a lot of perpetrators and abusers they can sniff out someone who has low self-esteem, someone who doesn't understand their worth. And when people get stuck in that cycle, it's because they can sniff them out. They know who they are. They know that they don't value or or, um, understand their worth. And so they will target those people. And so if you're not careful, you can easily get stuck in a cycle of uh, really toxic relationships if you're not really careful on working on yourself making sure you're really in tune and centered and grounded with who you are, what you want, and kind of getting into more of self-care and kind of a self-love mentality. Um, If you do that, you will attract the right person. But if you're stuck um, kind of in that toxic circle, typically it means that there's some work that you need to do within yourself first before you approach going on dates. Yeah. So when we hear those friends say, I don't know why I keep getting, like I'm a magnet for these jerks or these losers or whoever it is that they're attracting, then that's, that's a big sign of being, let me hold up the mirror. What is it about me that's attracting this? And, and if they do that, what should they be looking for? Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's, it's not always purposeful, but you know, I think that you just want to be sure that you're secure within yourself. Um, communication is really important too. the way that you communicate about yourself. Like I know there, especially women, women can be, um, kind of very self-deprecating and, um, you know, putting themselves down and, you know, depending on the guy, they can, they can pick up on it just like that. And it's like, Oh, that's the one for me. You know, that's the person that I can manipulate. Um, you know, that's the person that I can control. Um, that's the person that's going to be, um, maybe too nervous to leave or, or, you know, it's someone that I can kind of really keep my thumb over. Um, so you really want to speak positively about yourself and it takes time and maybe you have to kind of speak it until you believe it. Um, but you really have to make sure that you speak highly of yourself, that you think highly of yourself. And if there are things that you need to do to get you there, then do those things, do things that you love, do things that you enjoy. Um, I always encourage clients to make a list. So, Um, if your life, if you just wake up and your life just doesn't quite look like the way you want it to, you really want to have an idea of, okay, what, what would that look like? If you woke up tomorrow and life was great, what would that look like physically? Um, how would you feel? Who would be around you? Who wouldn't be around you? Um, you really want to paint the picture and, you know, sometimes we get really heady and in our heads about like, Oh, you know, I want to have this kind of life or that, but it really needs to be tangible. Um, so I always encourage people to write down, um, even if it's something with work or some other issue, if there's something that you're seeking and you're not happy, it's really important to be specific, to write it down and then to be intentional every day and just take little steps at a time to get you there and you can get there but you have to be intentional and you have to be really specific. And that also goes for relationships. Um, If you're looking for particular qualities, um, you really have to be intentional about seeking those people out. And then you also have to be sure that, you know, are those qualities that you possess? 
Mm-hmm. If, if, you know, if you want someone who's ABC, but you're, you know, toward the end of the alphabet, you have to look at, okay, how can I get a little further up the alphabet? Um, if I really want to attract somebody who, who has these particular qualities. Um, and I feel like with, with personal growth and development, we should always be learning and we should always be growing. Um, people can be very sensitive sometimes about, um, you know, improvement and, you know, I'm doing fine and, you know, I, I don't have any issues or, you know, it's all the guys and, you know, these guys are, are horrible. And, um, but there's always something we can be doing better. There's always some way that we can improve and do more. Um, and it's sometimes not till we get to relationships that can be so emotional that we kind of want to cut that off. We understand that with everything else in business, there's always something more that you can learn. Um, you know, if you're in school, there's always more, you want to be sure that you're grasping and understanding um, but sometimes with relationships, we fantasize it on such a level um, that it's it's hard to understand that even in love and relationships, there's always something we can be learning, whether we're just starting out dating or you've been married for 50 years. There's always something that you can learn. There's always some way that you can grow, develop or improve yourself or your relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So true. And a lot of times we don't we get caught up in the no, I'm good. Things are good. We will become complacent and that's when the wheels start falling off. So, yep. Yeah. Such a good point. And when you, when you talk to people um, and they come to you, are people at the time that they, they actually seek you out, they're probably ready to make some of those changes. It's getting to you is where the, the friction is, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Usually by the time they come to me, um, they've hit multiple roadblocks and it's kind of like a last ditch. Let's try something different, um, which is great. And I mean, and there's nothing wrong with it. I know that I was looking recently and divorce rates are actually decreasing, which is really interesting um, at this particular point in time. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that people are a little more open to getting some help. Um, you know, it's not as taboo to see a therapist or to see a relationship coach, um, or to work on yourself. Um, it's just not taboo anymore. You know, it's not the old age old, oh, you know, you're crazy. If you do something like that, um, we're kind of really breaking down some of those barriers in terms of the stigma of it, which is awesome. Um, but I think if people are just able to open themselves up and really explore, um, and take a look at maybe, in some ways, you know, we have relationships and it doesn't work out. We, we kind of carry some of that baggage along with us. And sometimes we make the next person suffer, right? Because we're <laughs> yeah. trying to kind of, you know, work ahead, so to speak, um, and cut them off at the past when they really haven't done anything wrong. And you're kind of punishing them for um, maybe some of the issues that you had in your previous relationship. Um, so sometimes it's hard to see that you're doing that when you're stuck in the cycle, you know, right. when you're in a situation, it's hard to see what's happening. Um, but someone with a kind of a bird's eye view that can step back, uh, someone that's not your best friend, that's going to, you know, automatically take your side, right? Somebody like your mom or someone else, um, someone that can really just take a step back and be a bit more objective and just say, you know, this is what I'm seeing, you know, does that resonate with you? Um, even a lot of times just hearing that feedback is so helpful for people. Yeah. Um, and even if it's just, you know, for, for a brief period of time, for a couple months, I think it can be really effective. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely. And, and I know from my experience, it's, it's helped tremendously, you know, and I'm thinking about all of the other things that are out there that are now influence, influence in us in ways that they hadn't before. And like the reality TV and oh, yes. setting our expectations to be different than what they are in real life. And although we see it as quote reality tv it is very scripted it is very well thought out and planned out or we wouldn't be watching it absolutely so you know i know you you talk like you did a lot uh talking about the bachelor and the bachelorette those kind of things what are you finding are the effects and how are they similar how are they different from real life well you know i think that Again, people fantasize about how they will meet their future partner, or maybe their spouse. Um, and so <clears throat> it's funny, I met someone the other day who said that he's going to meet his wife in Paris, which I said, you know, he may very well meet his wife in Paris. That would be amazing. That's great. Um, but what if you meet her at the dump? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Does that not make her amazing because she wasn't in Paris? Um, what if that's your perfect match, but she was at the dump in, you know, Reseda? Okay. Does that mean that that's not your ideal mate because she wasn't geographically in a different location because you weren't on vacation? Um, so we really get caught up in telling ourselves these stories and fantasies about what it's going to look like, what it's going to feel like when we meet our partner. And unfortunately, um, sometimes we cut off some really amazing opportunities with great people because it's not what we had envisioned it would look like. Or maybe it happens at a time that you didn't expect it to happen. You know, I don't want to meet anyone until after I'm 35. Mm. If you meet an amazing guy at 30, I've known some people who said I'm 30. They're perfect for me, but I'm not going to meet my perfect spouse until I'm over 35. Mm. It happens. So I say all that to say with shows like, you know, there's The Bachelor, there's The Bachelorette, there are a ton, ton of other dating shows. Um, I think there's a Jerome for Love that's, I believe, on Bravo. Um, and so, you know, we love the idea of romantic love and, you know, we meet someone on location and they take, you know, these amazing trips and it's ideal. And but that's not really real life. And I mean, you see some of that play out with some of the couples from The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. Um, you know, they don't always make it because, you know, when you're in paradise, you know, when you don't have laundry to do or dishes yeah. or traffic and commutes and your job and, and other demands from family or other commitments. I mean, it's easy, yeah. Um, but it's just not the day to day real life. And when you're searching for a life partner, um, not just like a vacation partner, but an actual <laughs> life partner, um, those are the things that you really have to work through. And you won't always know if it's a good match until you really start coming up against some of these real life issues that come up. It's not always going to be rosy. It's not always going to be walks through the park or along the beach. Um, and so sometimes it takes hitting a major roadblock to see, you know, will this relationship be able to stand the test of time just based on this um, small issue that we're dealing with? Will we work together or will it pull us apart? And so you see that happening a lot on these shows, but it looks amazing and romantic and oh, it's exciting. Yeah. And I'm a sucker for it because I love watching it too. So I'm <laughs> guilty. <laughs> I'm a hundred percent guilty too. Um, but I think you just kind of have to watch it for entertainment value and really just be careful that you don't have the expectation that you're going to meet someone that's, you know, riding in on a giant white horse that's going to come and save you or rescue you. Um, from your life. I think you want to make sure that your life is amazing as is. Um, whether you meet someone today or you meet someone 20 years from now, um, because the other thing is kind of like a rescue fantasy that happens a lot, particularly for women. Um, the idea that, you know, a guy is going to come and just rescue them from all of their issues and problems. And again, that puts so much stress on your partner and on the relationship to be perfect. No one is perfect. No situation is perfect. No relationship is perfect. Most people that I know that have been married for 20 plus years have hit some major issues somewhere along the line. Um, and it's just a matter of the fact that they were able to work through it together. Um, and it ultimately brought them closer, but it doesn't mean that it's perfect. Right. Right. Yes. And, and, you know, I talk to different people who watch some of these shows and, um, and, and what I wonder about is with, you know, older people who maybe, you know, like if we put people in age groups, you know, older generations probably understand they've been around longer, they've been in relationships, but for younger people who are just entering their early twenties and have been really exposed to this kind of stuff, and they have a different outlook of like what you put out there to the world, what you, what kind of pictures you post on your Instagram because you think that that's what everybody's posting or you put out there this, you know, there's a whole different, um, how you, how you present yourself at first, you know, and that's so much different than what it is in real life and going to the grocery store and doing laundry. And, you know, even as what we put on dating sites as our photos with the filters from Instagram or from Snapchat or whatever it is. I mean, you look amazing, but then when you show up, you're like, really, this is the lighting. What happened? You know, um, it's, it's a tough act to keep up with. It's a very tough yeah. act. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. There's, there's a lot of pressure to make everything beautiful and perfect and look like you're happy all the time, you know? 
And that actually happens in with, for people that are in relationships too. So it's interesting. Um, you have the singles that are kind of <clears throat> dealing with the dating sites and they're trying to, um, you know, present their best self or, or a better self. But you also have it with couples too, where um, there's kind of this pressure sometimes to present this perfect image of your relationship, you know, you're always laughing, you're always hugging, you know, you're always in love. Um, and that can kind of backfire sometimes too. Um, just the pressure to, uh, present a particular image because sometimes you're putting so much pressure on the image and maintaining the image that you lose sight of actually maintaining your real relationship. And I've seen that happen many times with couples where there's just so much of a focus on what they're presenting to the world that they forget about what's really happening at home. And you never want to neglect that just for the sake of, um, you know, public showing. You really want to be sure that you're putting more energy into your real relationship versus your Instagram photos, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. What are, what are some of the other things that you see in and talking a lot about the celebrity world and the TV world versus what you're encountering in in therapy with with couples or or people going out to seek their other half. Like, are there I, other discrepancies? And um, I mean, I think that the other thing that I've noticed quite a bit. Um, I was watching, for example, to Rome for Love, and so. It's interesting because there are some elements of it that I think that women really are dealing with um, in real life. Um, for example, um, I know that I believe it's Diane Valentine is the host for that show. Of course, and, her name um, is Valentine. Yes, yes, yeah. her name is Diane Valentine. Yes, <laughs> yes. And so, um, you know, she's she takes a group of women to Italy um, to introduce them to Italian men to see what the kind of dating scene is like there. It's very you should watch it if you haven't seen it. It's very <laughs> it's very interesting. Um, and so, but you know, there are a couple of women who are having some challenges, and it looks like maybe they weren't quite ready for that experience yet. And I see that happening a lot um, in real life as well. There's a lot of pressure if you're single, you know, to go out and date, go out and date, go out and date. Uh, and sometimes it's, you're just not ready. Sometimes it's too soon. And it's not always that you're just coming off the heels of another relationship, but sometimes it's just not the right time. And sometimes you need a break from dating and there's nothing wrong with being single. Yeah. And being content with that and not seeking um, anything else out at any given point or time. Um, you really want to be sure that you pursue it once you are ready versus once someone else says you should be ready. Because no one can tell you when you should date. Um, you know for yourself and you know if you're a little burned out or you're over it and you need a break. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. And a break could be a day, a week, a month or a year or more. I mean, it could be any of that. Um, so you don't have to be actively dating if you're single. Um, and I know that that came up on the show. Um, and I think some of the ladies warmed up eventually once they got used to the idea. But I think it's important that we don't for feel like we're forcing um, our single girlfriends or sisters or anyone else to, you know, forcing them on dates or forcing, you know, you're setting them up because um, they might not be ready. And that's that's totally OK. Yeah. And some people take longer than others. What about the, you know, I do hear a lot of people are like, oh, you should get out, just get out and get, get, get out there a few times and you'll get over this stuff quicker. And, and you're right. People aren't always ready, but at the same time, I see people who are like, I'm really just lonely and, you know, they'll seek anybody out because they just want to get rid of the loneliness instead of finding some sort of comfort or peace with themselves. Absolutely. That happens so much. Um, and it's tough, you know, I mean, it's, it's, if you're feeling lonely, if you're coming home alone and, you know, sometimes people will say, you know, I just, I want a warm body to come home to. Like, I almost don't care who it is. I just want there to be a warm body there. Get a dog. But of course, exactly. <laughs> but of course that's a slippery slope, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You can get a warm body, someone who's a complete jerk or, you know, someone mm -hmm. who's horrible. Um, and again, you can get stuck in a cycle of toxic relationships if you're just looking for a body. Because that's because not oftentimes, specific, right? Right. And oftentimes people that are looking for a body end up um, 
connecting with people who are completely closed off and emotionally unavailable. Yes. But that's because that's what you were putting out into the world, that you wanted a warm body. Mm-hmm. And so they are your warm body, but don't expect them to provide you with, you know, any additional um, like emotional support or stimulation. It's they just might be your warm body. And that's yeah, that's yeah. what you said you wanted. Right. So the going back to being very specific with your list and then finding how that matches up to your own self and, and going from there. Yeah. And lists can be tricky too, but I mean, I think that um, you really want to kind of evaluate what your actual list, if you have one, even looks like for a partner and like, does it make sense? Um, and are they really, you know, important issues? You know, I know some people have, you know, they have to have a certain height, they have to be a certain weight, they have to have a certain job, they have to live in a certain area, you know, especially living in Los Angeles. Living Mm. in a particular area is huge (laughs) for people. They have boundaries that they will not cross. They they will not drive in traffic. It's like that in New Um, York too. If you don't live in the same boroughs, forget it. Yeah. Uh, Someone wants to, you know, so someone meets someone in the South Bay and they live in the Valley. It's like, it'll never work. Forget it. (laughs) So that can happen from time to time too. But I think you really want to be clear um, that your list is specific, but also that it makes sense and that it's really going to serve what you're ultimately looking for, right? So you have a person, a partner in mind, they have certain qualities that you want, but sometimes the list that you create doesn't really match up with what you're saying you want. Yeah. Um, and not just physical qualities, but emotional qualities. Um, you really want to delve deep and see who you would partner best with. And again, we can kind of fantasize about who we, who we would want and what that would look like. But sometimes when we meet someone with those qualities, we find that that's really not what we want. So I think really the key in dating is knowing what you want, experiencing it, trying it out, and then you kind of evaluate from there. If it doesn't work out, okay, so maybe I don't want a guy that looks like that. Or maybe I don't want a woman who has this particular characteristic. And you kind of build off of that from there. Um, it doesn't sound particularly romantic, right? But it's also very efficient and kind of systematic. And I think that sometimes when you're approaching dating and relationships, you have to be a little systematic about it. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's nothing wrong with that. And I work with a lot of um, women in business that are really busy and they struggle with finding the time to date or meet someone. Um, But at the end of the day, it's about what your priorities are. So if dating and partnering with someone is really important for you, you're going to make the time. If it's not important to you, then you won't. And that's, that's completely okay. Yeah. If you're at a point in your life where that's just not at the top of the list, people will be there. Yeah. There's no problem. There's no problem. And it's but usually I think when just, you don't look that everybody comes to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's there, there's, there's nothing wrong with that, but I think people tend to toggle between the two. And it's just like, if you're not ready, it's not the right time. Let it go. Yeah. No problem and no pressure. And you know what? I love the the part about you saying being efficient with it, you know, finding out what you think you want, try it out. If it doesn't work, move on. That is really key, isn't it? Because do you find that a lot of people hang on to and keep dating somebody, even though they see the red flag and this isn't going to work, but they go there anyway, because there's nobody else in the queue. And it's comfortable and it's yeah. easy. And it's predictable. Even in relationships that are really tumultuous, they are nine times out of 10, incredibly predictable. Yep. You know when the fight is going to happen. You know what's going to set him off. You know what's going to set her off. You're kind of cycling through. Um, But it's predictable. And even the heartbreak um, that might be involved in that particular relationship, you can almost predict it, which people love. Yeah. They want to be able to predict their heartbreak. But it's really tough when you're going out there and meeting somebody new and you're exposed and you're really taking a chance on, is the heartbreak going to happen? When is it going to happen? What is it going to look like? Um, And so that's really the challenge is dating, meeting different people, trying different things out and still being able to maintain some sense of openness and vulnerability. Because if you really want a lasting long-term relationship, you have to be willing to be vulnerable. You have to. Um, if you're too closed off, it's just, it's almost never going to work long-term. Yeah. You have to be willing to be, and that it's, and it's, it's really tough to balance that. It's tough to put yourself out there time and time again, um, and be vulnerable with people to know that, you know, they might break your heart or it just might not work out. It just might not be a great fit. Um, but in the end it's worth it. Yeah. 
Yeah. You just have to trust in the process. Absolutely. Yeah. Every, and everything happens for a reason. And sometimes when things don't work out, you, you can learn from your relationships. And sometimes when they don't work out, you know, it's really important to know when to let go. Um, as you had mentioned earlier, people are kind of, you know, just staying in the same relationships. And, um, you know, sometimes you are being practically pulled away from someone. You're being guided elsewhere. But people can be particularly stubborn to hold on to what they know, thinking that that's maybe the best that they can get or achieve when there's something so amazing on the other side, if they would just let go. Right. And if they would just clear some things out, if they would just clear some things out of their life, it's right within their reach. But you have to be willing to let some things go in order for that to happen. So true. Yes, it's so true. It's so funny when things start getting crazy and we think they're at their worst, it's right around the corner that we're like, oh, there's, it's like Christmas. <laughs> every know? time, yeah. almost every time, if you can just hold on just long enough and keep a positive attitude, something amazing is on the horizon, but you just have to keep believing um, and just keep pushing forward. So true. Yes. This is really good information. I'm going to have to go back and listen to this a few times. <laughs> <laughs> good, I'm glad. The boyfriend and I, we always we always take note because this is um, super helpful. And we've talked to a lot of guests and, um, you know, it's come up. A lot of people are stuck in patterns of dating those same people over and having, you know, I want this, this and this, but they get it and then it just doesn't work out or that's not what they want. And, and a lot of times too, people, you know, in childhood are sometimes trying to emulate what their parents relationship looked like growing up. So they're trying to do the exact same yes. thing that they saw their mother and father do, or they want to do the complete opposite because you know, in their mind, the marriage was a disaster and they want to do the complete opposite of what their parents did. Yep. Um, and so a lot of the work that I do with folks too, is just kind of breaking that down and kind of acknowledging the fact that maybe you're chasing ghosts, so to speak, and you really want to be clear on setting your own path, your own intentions, and kind of fostering what you want your relationship to look like, because it should be unique. Your relationship should be unique to you and your partner. It doesn't need to mirror anyone else's on TV, off of TV, your friends, your parents or anyone else. And it, your relationship is what you make it and whatever works for you all as a couple is what works for you. And you kind of have to clear out everyone else's thoughts and opinions. If it works for the two of you, that's, that's awesome. That's all that matters. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I love it. I love it. So this is, this has been so helpful and I'm glad that we got to hear about uh, Gwen and Blake. In the bachelor's, yeah, in the bachelor's and bachelorettes. <laughs> yeah. Is there any any other? Uh, oh, I w I did want to ask you about Prince Harry and. Uh, oh yes. Meghan. Yeah. Yes. Yes. The the wedding is in May, I believe. Right. Mm -hmm. That should be very interesting. Um, I, talk about a really interesting story. Um, and she's from the Los Angeles area, I believe, which was yeah. so fascinating. I actually know somebody that went to school with her, which is kind of unbelievable. Um, it's really interesting and I'm really curious to see how she kind of acclimates to royal life. Um, what that's going to look like. They're a young couple. Mm -hmm. Um, they're both very young. And so, you know, Prince Harry has been known to shake some things up from time to time. Yes, he has. Uh, he has. <laughs> so I'm really curious to kind of see where the relationship goes. Um, and what their role will be in the Royal Palace is going to be very interesting, but it's going to be exciting. Things are different. And she's a divorcee. And you know, uh, she's a divorcee. Yes. And that's, yes. that's huge because, uh, you know, knowing the history of the Royal family, that that's a big no, no. And, uh, the queen's sister wasn't allowed to marry to a divorcee. Um, so this is, this is very new. It's going to be very interesting. I'm definitely going to be tuning in. I'm looking forward to it. Me too. And I've been watching all of the, the PDA and they've done their, all of their photographs are done differently and they're breaking a lot of the rules and the traditions, but she did take down her. This is one thing that I, I found very interesting is the do's and don'ts of um, the Royal family. Just yes. down to their nail polish. They can't have yes. the bright colored nail polish. Also, they can't do any selfies because that is very vain. 
Interesting. I didn't hear that one. Yes, they are not allowed to take selfies and post selfies on social media. All of the social media for the royal family is done for them um, because it's it sh- they should not be self serving. And um, mm. mm-hmm. and so she already took down her Instagram account and things like that. Yeah. Oh, did she? Yeah. Wow. I, I'm really I'm really curious to see how long they last with all of these rules. Yeah. Particularly the nail polish. The nail polish just seems a little. Yeah, a little extreme. Well, you know, uh, a lot of it, I guess, comes from and the the other rule that they have is they must always uh, travel with uh, uh, black attire in case there's a funeral. And that's because when the um, queen, when her when her father died, when he passed, she was traveling during that time and she didn't have clothes and um she had to travel for like a day home and all the press was following her and she didn't have appropriate attire. And, um, so now they always travel with that in case of an emergency of sorts. And, you know, it's going to be very yeah. interesting because so much of, of, you know, the Royal family and the rules, um, it's so heavily based on appearances. Yes. And, you know, I feel like particularly in 2018, that's going to be really tough to keep up with over the long term. So I'm just, you know, just kind of having an idea of what their personalities are like. Um, I wonder, will they be kind of the couple to kind of start bending the rules and to change things a little bit for the royal family? It could be. She's starting. She is not wearing uh, pantyhose with dresses and photographs. Oh, she's already, already a renegade. She is running with scissors (laughs) over there. (laughs) Look out, people. Baby steps, baby steps. (laughs) So we'll see what we will see what transpires after the the royal wedding. But there's, hopefully we can get a hopefully we can get a red nail before it's over. We'll see. Well, <laughs> probably before rather than after. So right, we'll find out. And and you know what? On that note, I'm just wondering: is there any any bit of advice or anything that you want to leave the listeners with? I'm for sure going to leave all your contact info in the show notes so that they'll be able to easily access that at any time. But um, yeah, any any final words? Um, I think my, my final words would just be, there's nothing wrong with seeking out help. Um, if you're having a particular issue or concern in your love life or in other er any other area of your life, um, we seek help for pretty much everything else. Um, you know, we seek out a doctor if we're having a medical issue. Um, but a lot of times when it comes to love and relationships, there's kind of a shame or a fear of seeking help from someone else. And the reality is that we don't learn everything about love and relationships in elementary school. And sometimes we need some additional skills. We need someone to come in that kind of has a bird's eye view of what your situation looks like, someone who has a fresh perspective um, and someone that can really kind of help guide you and really just remind you about some of the things that you already know. But a lot of times it's about teasing those issues out really bring them to the surface and then you can really take off from there. So I would just say just to be open to um, receiving some help and some guidance. Awesome. Yes. And that's why they're listening. So we are so glad that, that you were with us today and that you shared all of this cool information. This is really helpful and um, I love it. I love it. And I will definitely want to keep in touch with you. Um, you guys got to check out our Facebook page because I know you have the videos about your dating insight on there. Right. Yes. So yep. I highly encourage people to take a look and check that out because there's a lot of good stuff to be had. So Rhonda, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It was great. My pleasure. My pleasure.